Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we will discuss genetic counselling. If we see the evolution of the medicine in the last uh, two decades, significant changes have occurred in the uh, practice of medicine because we have human genome project which just got completed in 2003 and we are reaping the benefits or its medical application in the day to day practice. So, we will discuss what is one of the important applications of genetics in the field of medicine. I will discuss genetic counselling over next 25 to 30 minutes in brief, how we practice genetic counselling in the clinic. Before I discuss uh, genetic counselling in particular, I would like to define two words for you. One is consultant, you can note down the spelling here, it is not consultant, it is consultant is a person who, is, who seeks the genetic counselling from a geneticist or a genetic counsellor in the clinic for a particular condition in the family or for a particular condition at which uh, uh, for which he or she is at risk of developing. Proband when I say proband it is the affected member in the family who brings the family to the medical attention. It is the, the first affected member who brings the family to the medical attention. A proband can be consultant as well. He can consult for uh, or he can seek genetic counselling for his own condition or her own condition, but consultant may or may not be affected with the genetic disorder. So, these are the two important terminologies which I would like to define before we proceed on to tell what is genetic counselling. Uh, if we need to define genetic counselling in simple words, I have uh, displayed it for you here. You can see few words are highlighted here which are really important for com conveying the meaning of genetic counselling. Genetic counselling is defined as the process, it is actually a process, uh, it is uh, a, an activity between a counsellor and the consultant or counsellee we say. Uh, it is a process of communication, especially two way communication. The counsellor gives information and consultant seeks information and it is two way uh, communication where they need to clarify several doubts or several queries mutually and education, education of the family concern which addresses concerns relating to the development and or, or transmission of a hereditary disorder. Usually genetic counselling is for a genetic disorder or hereditary disorder regarding transmission or even development of a genetic disorder. So, it is a two way process between a consultant and the counsellor regarding the occurrence or recurrence or transmission of a gen genetic disorder and it is actually a communication process. Genetic counsellors are supposed to have good communication skills to communicate science to the patients or the families with regard to their disease in question. We have a definition by the genetic counsellors task force which was done in 2006. I will just read it for you. Genetic counselling is the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological and familial implications of genetic contributions to the disease which integrates the following. There are three components here. Interpretation of the family and medical histories. This is the traditional medical practice to assess the chance of disease occurrence or recurrence. That means, whether the disease will occur or with not that is one issue. Second, if already there is some person who is affected, whether it will recur in second individual or so on, then that is one thing. S that is assessment of family and medical history to know whether there will be risk of a particular disease. Second is education about the inheritance, testing, management, resources and research. This means, we tell about the disease to the families and how it is inherited what are the ways to test, 
I am speaking about genetic testing later and how do we manage, can we be treated, can it be prevented and what are the available resources for patients in terms of maybe support group or medical resources or financial resources or some kind of support for them in a system or a medical system may be multidisciplinary uh, setting and then whether there is something because genetics is uh, evolving field of medicine there is always research component attached to various medical practices including genetic counseling. Then third component is counseling to promote informed choices and adaptation to the risk or the condition. So, we give information, we counsel them to promote informed choices patients or the families or the consultant are informed about what are the available options to them and helping them to adapt to the particular disease or adapt to the risk or how to handle the risk. So, this is the uh, definition given by the genetic counselors task force in 2006. For any successful genetic counseling, the most important or the crucial step is establishing a diagnosis. In our medical practice, we have several situations. For example, we have fever, we really are better off if you know the cause, but fever can be treated symptomatically. But when it comes to genetic counseling, most of the diseases, in most of the situations, we need a definitive diagnosis for a, step, uh, for a um, definitive genetic counseling. Otherwise, your genetic counseling may not be accurate, your testing may not be accurate, probably it will be a disaster. Why I would tell you here, see for example, we take deafness as one of the disease or symptom or a physical sign which can be caused by intrauterine infection like uh, cytomegalovirus or rubella, congenital rubella infection or it can be neonatal exposure to a uh, drug like amikacin or gentamicin where the baby loses hearing and it is probably not genetic, it is because of the environmental exposure. I know there are few. Um, genetic predisposing factors for this kind of uh, drug induced toxicity or it can be mutation in connexin 26 gene which is the most common cause of uh, genetic deafness, there may be several causes of deafness. What I would like to tell you here is, if you think deafness is genetic in a family which is actually not which is because of congenital rubella virus infection, your genetic testing would go haywire and your counseling would not be appropriate, the risk of recurrence everything will be different. So, we need to appreciate diseases which appear same may be etiologically very heterogeneous, it may not be genetic or even for deafness there are at least 40 genes or more genes which cause deafness. So, you really do not know which one whether it is an autosomal dominant condition, whether it is autosomal recessive condition or whether it is X linked or whether it is mitochondrial. So, the counseling and testing would differ. Even for diseases like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or charcot marie tooth disease or retinitis pigmentosa when we say some are recessive, some are dominant, some are uh, X linked, the risk of recurrence would vary which we will be dealing with another session on inheritance pattern because diseases are same, but the genes are different and we have different modes of inheritance for a given condition. Actually if you see the practice of genetics in the last few years, we can clearly establish a molecular diagnosis for several of the genetic conditions and then we get cleared of the doubts whether it is a recessive dominant which gene is involved and then we have a clear picture about what is the risk of recurrence, how it can be tested, how prenatal counseling can be done, how prenatal testing can be done. When we speak about genetic counseling, it is usually providing the risk figure, risk of some disease occurring, some disease recurring. So, we take the help of our basic knowledge of Mendelian inheritance pattern and few factors which I will be discussing now. So, we are traditionally taught autosomal recessive diseases have 25 percent risk of recurrence, autosomal dominant disorders have 50 percent of the risk, 50 percent risk of recurrence if the parents are affected, one of the parents is affected. If they are unaffected, it is a de novo or a new mutation in the child, the risk of recurrence is very low except for gonadal mosaism which makes person uh, at the risk of this uh, disease happening again in the, in the next offspring where the risk of recurrence is likely to be 1 percent or 2 percent or it is very low. So, we have traditional inheritance patterns and traditionally defined risks that is how we calculate the risk of recurrence or occurrence 
if somebody has a mutation, what is the risk of the disease developing? Okay. Then we need to consider all diseases which we speak may not be completely penetrant or they may have variable expressivity. I will tell you here, penetrance refers to the manifestation of the disease in people who have the mutation. So, what proportion have the disease? Okay, so, it is like number of persons showing the phenotype among patients who have the genotype. So, it is a fraction, it may be 80 percent, which would mean 80 percent of the patients with a particular mutation would have the disease. So, it is an all or none phenomena and uh, if the uh, penetrance is six, uh, 50 percent, 50 percent of the individuals with a mutation will have the disease. So, if you follow the traditional inheritance pattern and say that 50 percent is the risk of rec uh, recurrence or occurrence of breast cancer, it may not be 100 percent penetrant. The penetrance may be 60 percent, where we should say the risk of developing breast cancer because there is a mutation in BRCA1 gene is 60 percent because that is the penetrance. In the same way, there is another concept which we need to understand expressivity. That means, a disease despite having the same mutation may have variable expression, different expression. Some may be mild, some may be severe, some may be moderate. For if you take an example of neurofibromatosis, some can have some affected individuals with the mutation can have few neurofibromas, some may have even within the same family thousands of neurofibromas, some may be having mild intellectual disability, some may have some tumors. So, it varies from person to person, the risk of getting the disease is almost 100 percent, but the severity may be mild to moderate or severe. So, we need to keep this in mind, the quality of the risk as well. We need to remember genetic disorders occur in or manifest early in age, but some diseases like Huntington disease may be the individual carrying the mutation may be healthy during childhood and adolescence and as an adult or uh, it can be uh, manifesting late in older individuals in their fifth or sixth decade. So, we need to keep in mind that some diseases manifest late. So, that we call delayed age of onset which we need to add to the quality of the risk which I will be discussing further. How do we present the risk? Risk of this is what we usually practice in uh, genetics, we say the risk of this, de this is developing is 25 percent, 50 percent and so on. So, the risk figure in genetic counseling has two quality, two attributes, one is quantity, second one is quality. If you go to quantity, it is like the absolute terms, 1 in 4, 25 percent or 1 is to 3, we give the risk figure or the quantity. Remember, it applies to each pregnancy that lady or the couple undergo, because chance does not have memory. What has happened in the previous pregnancy does not have any bearing. Many times we are asked in the clinic, our two children are affected and you say risk is 50 percent, so the third baby should be normal. It is not true. Every pregnancy has the same risk and the chance does not remember what has happened in the previous pregnancy. So, we often cite the example of tossing a coin. When we toss a coin, the chance of getting heads or tails is 50 percent. The second time you toss the coin, the risk is again same 50 percent, third time it is 50 percent. There may be few occasions where you get heads consecutively for two or three times or tails, but if you take an average it is 50 percent of the times it is heads and 50 percent of the times it is tails. Remember when we give the risk of risk figure of 25 percent or 5 percent or 1 percent, generally people take the risk figure with more importance than what is safe or what is the chance of normal pregnancy or chance of not developing the disease. It is important when you counsel, emphasize the good side as well. For example, for recessive disease, we say risk of having a normal baby, uh, an abnormal baby is 25 percent, which also means there is 75 percent chance the baby is normal. So, you can often tell 75 percent is the chance of having a normal baby, 25 percent is the chance of having an abnormal baby. This is very important how people perceive, okay, that is one thing. Second thing, quality of the risk. It may be simple polydactyl when we say additional uh, finger or toe, which may not be harmful at all. It can be removed if you do not like it or sometimes it may be very severe neural tube defect when the formation of the spine is defective 
and people usually do not walk or they have difficulty in controlling their bowel and bladder movements or it can be some diseases like Duchenne muscular dystrophy where boys are normal up to 4 or 5 years of age then they gradually develop weakness and slowly they have disease progression and they usually succumb to the disease in, the, in their second decade of life. So, here you have at one end a mild polydactyly which does not really affect the health situation of the health of the person new severe neural tube defect and in between is something like Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I have just taken three examples to show you the quality of the risk may be different for from disease to disease. I often tell in the clinic that it is like playing tennis or playing cricket where we need a counsellor needs to be very alert or the batsman or the player how the uh, ball bounces on the pitch what direction it takes in the same way we get responses from the families. Some families would understand everything what you speak some may not and some may really put you a bouncer. So, you need to be really understand the education background, so social circumstances, the, their family issues, personal uh, attitudes towards different disease situations or difficulties, finances. So, every family would respond in a different way despite having the same disease. So, this is very important and the counsellor need to be needs to be very alert to handle the situation because counselling for each family is different. So, this is what I would like to highlight here we need to tell the quality tell the quantity not just provide risk figure not just pro, uh, uh, tell briefly about the disease it is important that families understand what situation they are facing. Now, it is important to understand for the counsellor that it is the patients or the families or the consultant they have to decide whether the particular risk is high or low. Some people with the 1 percent risk they get uh, alarmed oh is it 1 percent risk for my family, but some people may say 5 percent risk is very easy to take or even 25 percent and I do not bother about such low risk let me get the test done or let me not get the test done and it is also remember uh, important to remember that out of 100 pregnancies 2 to 3 babies are born with major malformation. So, 1 in chance 40 is the chance of congenital malformation in the background or in the general population this we need to know. So, this is really more than 1 percent it is 2 to 3 percent. So, what we are providing is additional risk against this background risk. So, people or the families need to understand what is high risk for them what is low risk for them and it is not the counsellor who will tell what is high or low risk for them. And once we provide the uh, disease and the natural history of the disease management options then testing options or the risk figure we need to tell what are the choices open to the family. It may be testing, not testing, treating, not treating or providing the best care or several options for conception or prenatal testing or m further management. E when we do some genetic tests or techniques we need to tell about the how it is done, what are the limitations, what are the risks associated with various procedures may be for testing or the diagnosis or for the treatment or for the prevention. Medical termination may not be viewed acceptable to many of the families for some families it may be acceptable for some for religious or personal reasons it may not be acceptable. So, we need to be very careful when we provide this option. Uh, then we have some reproductive options like donor OR donor gametes and pre implantation genetic disease, uh, uh, diagnosis which is now becoming available even in our country we need to handle the sensitivities or emotions or the reactions with utmost care and sensitivity when we deal with the patients. Often we say um, medicines can have adverse reactions even the words of the doctor or the counsellor or the geneticist can have adverse reactions similarly. I have already told it is two way communication the counsellor and the proband or the consultant they communicate in an open atmosphere where consultants are allowed to ask whatever the doubts they have and clear them and it is two way process. Sometimes you may might have to ask some 
uh, questions to know whether they have understood what you have told or the science or the information. We need to be sympathetic here. They, it is uh, if some family is suffering already because of the disease, so we need to be very careful when we use the words during counselling. Some families un have guilty because they feel that they for something they have done or something they have not done this has the genetic situation or the condition or the disorder has happened. Some people are angry, some people are depressed, but most of the people would adjust, but may take different length of time. Some people would adjust quickly, some people would take lot of time, they might go through different phases of emotions like guilt, anger or depression. Several, if each family behaves in a different way psychologically and emotionally, so we need to be very sensitive for these things. When we counsel better to avoid technical terms, because sometimes uh, they may not understand and make sure that they have understood these issues and be very honest. When you communicate science, when we communicate latest information to the patient, be honest, there is no need to falsely assure something or falsely project something which is really not very uh, dangerous. So, we if uh, highlighting small risk of half percent or one percent may not be really appropriate, we need to be very honest. Many times I will tell you we have lot of limitations in the science, it is better to put them put it across in the same way and uh, then uh, than telling something which you really do not know, I will tell you later. And next is answer the questions, ask them do you have any questions to ask, do you have any queries, that is how we do the counselling. Whatever information we provide should be latest, that means we have to read every day, because genetics is rapidly evolving field, every week or every month we have new information about most of the genetic diseases some diseases may be new, some mutation may be new, some treatment may be new. So, we need to be updated. I would say without internet you cannot practice genetic counselling because every disease we have lot of new information coming up. Many times we may not know things or there may not be enough literature. So, it is important we search the literature carefully and we provide latest information and if it is not available, you accept that is currently it is a limitation of science. So, you say this treatment is not possible or it, there is not enough information in the literature and this disease is not well described. So, this is possible and we may not have uh, sufficient information. Be truthful as of uh, as on date whatever information is there you should be giving rather than telling probably uh, giving some in false information. I always recommend we give a written summary to the patient, because it is what they are going to take home and they are going to read. So, you have to be very careful when you write the clinical summary, it should be something which should not which which, uh, which should be as perfect as possible. I know that it is not easy to write a uh, summary for the patient, use words very cautiously, give latest up to date accurate information as much as possible so that they can go back and recollect from what you have talked and read and refer to the summary, this is very important. Sometimes uh, one session may not be, I would say often one session may not be important, they might have lot of questions once they go back. If possible schedule follow up visits and call them or ask them, encourage them to come again and clear their doubts, so that they take the information properly to the uh, regarding their condition and often the settings uh, should be perfect. It is an intense communication process, so we should have a quiet private place with uh, comfortable sitting arrangement for the patient, definitely for the counsellor as well, where we can tackle their emotions, tackle their feelings, tackle their uh, issues very comfortably, there should not be another reason for discomfort. So, I would recommend a private comfortable place for counsellor and consultant to sit and discuss these issues. We need to arrange support in the form of follow up sessions, even a long term support, they might require long term support for especially for adult onset disorders like uh, Huntington disease or Alzheimer's disease, they might want to come to you again and again, talk to you again or even patient support groups. When I say patient support groups, it is like patients with the similar diseases get together and discuss their problems, work for solutions, uh, advocate for 
their own uh, diseases and encourage research or mixing up or getting together uh, of the families or the patient with the same diseases, this should be encouraged. One of the crucial things is uh, uh, non-direct in, in genetic counseling. We are not supposed to take a decision for the patient or the family, but often they ask what should I do, what would you have done or what in others uh, in the same situation I have done better avoid being drawn into expressing your opinion because it is every family perceives the risk or the problems in a different way and ask the consultant how he would feel after the decision, after taking a decision. Do not express the opinions on uh, your opinions because it is them who has to take the decision. It is the consultants, not the counsellors who have to live with the decision because after your consultation or counselling is over, they have to go back and live with their, uh, their decisions. So, it is important we do not tell them you do this. Traditionally, fathers would tell the children or mothers would tell the children this is how you should do and the doctors would prescribe medicines, but here counsellors would give them options and they have to take it from the menu and decide what they would like to do. But our duty is to facilitate informed counselling or they get all the information before they take a decision which is appropriate for them. We have uh, they should be able to recall after a successful counselling what has been discussed accurately because it has an impact on subsequent reproductive behaviour and actually it is a mutually satisfying experience. You as a counsellor you understand you have been successful in counselling because you see the response, you assess them and patient should be satisfied despite patients having lot of emotional or other problems to deal with. Your counselling session should be something which would relieve their stress and which would help them to make a, an informed decision rather than create more problems by giving uh, learning something which is not correct. Several issues warrant or several situations warrant counselling. It can be a diagnostic testing for genetics or a predictive testing whether the disease would occur or not and carrier testing where we say couple whether they would get a child with a particular disease or not, whether they can marry somebody who is a carrier or not a carrier. We have prenatal testing, pre-implantation testing or newborn screening where we test healthy newborns whether they would have sub certain disease or it can be paternity testing. I would now list several indications for genetic counselling. This is just list like congenital malformation, pregnancy loss, mental retardation or intellectual disability, neurodegenerative disorders muscular dystrophies, congenital myopathies, inborn errors of metabolism, most of them are genetic disorders, disorders of sexual development, skeletal dysplasias or bone diseases, childhood deafness, any known Mendelian disorder for that manner and unusual so disorders of skin, eye, bones where we suspect a genetic etiology, chromosomal abnormalities, relatives of an individual with a chromosomal rearrangement or genetic disease, any familial disease. There are several other indications like familial cancer, an individual uh, with a relative with familial cancer or multiple cancers or uh, cancers on both sides for example, breast cancer or cancer prone diseases. We have something like Bloom, Bloom syndrome where they are predisposed to cancer or it can be a pregnant lady who is exposed to a teratogen inadvertently taking medicines or drugs or getting exposed to certain uh, environmental agents which can have harmful effects for the baby or consanguineous marriage, advanced maternal age and positive screening for a genetic disorders. These are the few things. In our clinical practice, uh, we have Down syndrome which is the most common reason for referral or for counselling which is the most common genetic disorders of chromosomal abnormality where we tell what is Down syndrome how do the children develop, what do they do, whether it can recur, what are the treatment options available, whether it can recur in subsequent pregnancies, what way we can prevent its occurrence or recurrence in the population or in the families. Then we have something like, I am just citing few examples, the com most common situations, beta thalassemia major which requires lot of 
medical care because they cannot produce hemoglobin or blood commonly uh, uh, efficiently then we need to give them blood transfusions bone marrow transplantation is a definitive cure and then the risk of recurrence is 25 percent of the couple subsequent pregnancies and prenatal testing can be offered if we have a mutation detected bone marrow transplantation is curative but it is at present it is expensive we need to have an hla matched donor otherwise they have lot of morbidities of blood transfusion or chelation therapy um, muscular dystrophy again they that is a progressive disorders affecting childhood if it is duchenne muscular dystrophy becker's muscular dystrophy it is usually adolescents or adults it is a progressive disease and how they can be supported what are the limited limited options for treatment and how it can be prevented these are the three common situations this is an x linked condition which occurs only in boys and the risk of recurrence in subsequent pregnancy is 25 percent so we need to be very sensitive here because this affects only boys so we have law which says prenatal sex selection or sex determination is illegal in our country so we should be very careful careful in handling this situation i would not discuss individual diseases because it is beyond the scope of the current presentation but uh, we can read uh, about each situation and how to counsel and i would suggest gene reviews as one of the best uh, places to go and read further about individual diseases thank you